Good afternoon and welcome, especially to those visitors who are with us and those who are watching online. We're grateful to be together. Our adult education, religious education adult series will begin this weekend with a series from Bishop Barron on the Mass. So uh, from 9.30 to 10.30 on Sundays, looking forward to that. There are six sessions. Attend as many as you can to learn more about the beauty of our Mass that we celebrate together. 40 Days for Life will once again be happening at the Planned Parenthood in Bloomington. This will run from September 23rd through November 1st from 8 o'clock a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. each day. See the bulletin for details and to sign up. They are also in need for men of the parish to pray throughout the night during the 40 Days for Life Sleep No More initiative, which is happening this Thursday as that gets kicked off. So if you're interested in helping, that would be from 8 p.m. Thursday evening to 8 o'clock Friday morning. And you can contact Sharon Buby for more information on that. And we hold as a parish that 40 days for life in our, in our prayers. And once again, the collection baskets are at the back of the church, so we won't take up a collection, but they will be at the back as you're leaving. And thank you very much for your support. And we are very happy this weekend to welcome Father Tom Carroll from the Purist Father's Mission. Uh, we're grateful to have you with us and look forward to hearing more about your ministry and mission work. So there's three ways you can help Father Tom. One, there's some envelopes that he has that you can put your offering in there and put it in the basket or take it home and bring it back maybe next week, but any checks would be made out to St. Agnes for that or we can put cash in the blue basket. So this blue basket back there is, is for this particular collection. Or you can go to our online giving, and it's also on there as well as an opportunity to offer. So we're grateful to have you with us. For communion, we'll come up to the center aisle, so make your way across to the center aisle. Great to be together, and have a good weekend. Our opening song is All Are Welcome. Let's begin this, the grace of all prayers, by making the sign of the cross together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
my brothers and sisters, in order to celebrate these sacred mysteries, let's take a moment, think back over the past week, and see how we might have offended our Lord, and then we'll ask for his forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin to the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sin to the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law, upon love of you and of our neighbor. Grant that, by keeping your precepts, we may merit to attain eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call him when he is near. Let the scoundrel forsake his way and the wicked his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord for mercy, to our God who is generous in forgiving. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are yours your ways, my ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm is the Lord is near to all who call upon him. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. The Lord is good to all and compassionate toward all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. 
The Lord is just in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. The Lord is near. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, life is Christ and death is gain. If I go on living in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I shall choose. I am caught between the two. I long to depart this life and be with Christ, for that is far better. Yet, that I remain in the flesh is more necessary for your benefit. Only, conduct yourselves in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. The word of the Lord. with you. I read from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them back into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, the landowner saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you too, go into my vineyard, and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, The landowner found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too, go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the daily usual wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last ones worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who bore the day's burden and the heat He said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? 
Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. First of all, I'd like to thank Archbishop Thompson for giving me this opportunity to speak to you this evening. My name is Father Tom Carroll, and I am a purist father. That's spelled P-I-A-R-I-S-T. We pronounce it purist, like where you put a boat at a pier and then put an I-S-T on the end of it. I have to say it that way because I've been introduced as a parish father, purist father, penis father. And since I'm originally from Pittsburgh, and for you baseball fans, you can understand I didn't mind this. I was once introduced as a pirate father. But purist is the way we say our name. And like many groups of priests, <clears throat> we take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but we also take a fourth vow, and that is to educate youth. So wherever we go in the world, we open up schools. Back at Easter in 1988, the Pierce Fathers in the United States had a meeting at their school outside Philadelphia. And there they made a decision to open up a new school. And they put down two conditions that had to be met. First, it had to be in a place where it was impossible for Catholics of high school age to receive a Catholic high school education. And there are many places in our country like that. The second condition, it had to be in one of the poorest areas of our country. And for a couple of reasons, our attention was being drawn to Eastern Kentucky, which is part of Appalachia, a region that's known for its poverty. One of the things that caught our attention was an article in the United States News and World Report, which in that year, 1988, ranked Kentucky last among the states in the quality of its educational programs. And then we learned there was a new diocese being formed, the Diocese of Lexington. And we thought it'd be nice belonging to a new diocese to kind of grow right along with it. So we approached the new Bishop of Lexington, told him our plans, and asked him where in his diocese, which is made up of 50 counties, it's one-third of Kentucky, where should we look to establish a school? And he says, I want you to take a look at the Big Sandy region. Now the Big Sandy is a river that separates Kentucky from West Virginia, so I'm talking about as far east in Kentucky as you can go. And the Big Sandy region is made up of six counties. It's about 100 miles north to south, 50 miles east to west. When we went there to check it out, we found the poverty that we expected to find. But we learned a couple of other things, too. Like there's only two employers, the coal industry, and by that I don't mean just the mining of coal, but those that truck it, those that make and repair the machinery used in the mines, in the school districts, which for the most part are countywide. And unless somebody knows somebody in the coal industry or on the school board, they have very little chance of getting a job by which they can't support a family. Catholic scenario, number less than one half of 1% 1 of the population. There were three parishes and five mission churches in that six-county area, and three diocesan and priests ministering to the Catholics in six counties. Well, since the nearest Catholic high school was 120 miles away in Lexington, this place met the two conditions. And in September of 1988, I was sent with just my personal belongings to Eastern Kentucky 
And one of the three pastors said, well, you need a place to stay, so why not stay with me for the first year? Well, you learn about the people, their customs, their culture, their background, their fears, their hopes, and I did. The following summer, a second Pierce joins me. And now we gotta find a place of our own. But we were lucky because there was a group of Benedictine nuns in the area and on the ground to their monastery, they had a vacant house. And their superior said to me, why don't you move into that vacant house? And then you can become our chaplain. I hesitated for a moment, but she noticed that and she quickly added, oh, you gotta eat supper with us too. And I said, we'll move in. <laughs> and then there's an organization called the Christian Appalachian Project, which does a lot of good for the poor in Eastern Kentucky. In 1984, they built a high school, but for a number of reasons, in 1988, it closed. And when they heard that we wanted to open up a high school, they approached us and said, we have the building. Would you be interested in leasing it for a dollar a year? And of course, we took it. Now, why have these people and these organizations and others like them, why have they gone out of their way to help us get established? There's two reasons. First, those who've been working among the poor in Appalachia for many years are convinced that the only way of ending the poverty that is there is by providing young people with a good education so you can go away to good colleges and good universities and someday come back and help this area economically. This is a dream. But it's the only one they have. And in some areas of eastern Kentucky, two-thirds of the population has not graduated from high school. They drop out for different reasons, realizing they're receiving a poor education, so what's the point in going to school? Or they don't know anybody in the coal industry or on the school board, so they're not going to get a job when they graduate, so attending classes is a waste of time. Or maybe their parents haven't gone past the sophomore year of high school. They feel they shouldn't go past the sophomore year of high school either. And the parents, because they're so afraid of their young leaving the area, don't discourage them. But let me give you an example of a poor education. We have a very fine office manager in our school. She talks about her high school. She says, you know, we had to have one semester of astronomy. And the final grade was based on the final exam. And the final exam was made up of one question. Name the planets. If you could name the planets, you got an A in astronomy for the semester. Second reason people have helped us out is to spread our own Catholic faith. If I asked you, what organized church do you think most of the people in Appalachia belong to, most of you, after recalling it's part of the Bible Belt, would take a guess and say the Baptist church. And to a certain degree, you'd be right. Most of the people in Eastern Kentucky that belong to an organized church belong to the Baptist Church. But in a survey done by the Southern Baptist Convention in the county where I live, 89% of the population is unchurched. They don't belong to the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of Christ, no church at all. In a county that borders us on the north, 94% of the population is unchurched. And when I read that report, I went to a priest who really knew the people in their background. And I said, can you explain to me how 90% of the population is unchurched? And he said, you're forgetting the background of the people. And this background helps to explain the fear that parents have of their young leaving the area. 95% of the population 
in eastern Kentucky can trace their roots back to people who settled there before the Revolutionary War. They came mainly from England, Scotland, Ireland, and Germany, couldn't find work in cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia, so they moved into the Appalachian Mountains. Many like following the example of Daniel Boone, who was a Pennsylvanian, went down to the Carolinas and then came up from the Cumberland Gap to eastern Kentucky. But no priest went with them. No minister went with them. But they were a people who knew their Bible, and today they still know their Bible. And they have a great love for Christ. And they call themselves Christians. It's just they don't bother belonging to a church. When we opened up our school, we made a decision that many people thought was foolish. We said there'll be no tuition. We thought we could do it because we were getting a building for a dollar a year and the peers fathers themselves receive absolutely no salary. But we thought that if we had tuition of $500 a year, there'd be people who couldn't pay that, wouldn't apply, and we would be defeating our purpose in being there. And every year something happens to make us realize that we made the right decision. For instance, I often think about a girl named Beth who wanted to come to our school, but a month before school was to begin, she telephoned me and she couldn't come. She said she couldn't come. And I said, Beth, why not? She said, I just can't come. But I kept pressuring her until finally she said, it's money. I said, I'll talk with your mother this evening. And that evening, I did go and sit down and talk with Beth's mother. I said, you know, when you first come to the school, it's a sign you're really coming. We asked for $20 to go along with the registration fee. Most of the textbooks are donated by other schools from around the country. But a couple you're going to have to buy, and it's going to cost you $40. All the students wear a golf shirt with the name of the school in it. They're $14.50 apiece. How many did you order? She said, two. I said, well, that's $29. Now let's put this all together. That's $89. Can you pay $89? And she said, but that's the first semester. I said, no, that's the whole year. Can you pay $5 a month? She said, I think so. Well, the entire time that Beth was in her school, she never paid for books, shirts, or that registration fee. We never asked the family for it because we knew they didn't have it. But I think a lot about Beth because six or seven years ago, I'm losing a little bit of track here, um, she received a PhD in psychology from the University of Washington. And yet, we have lay teachers to pay, utility bills to take care of, school supplies, office supplies to purchase. We go out and pick up the students and bring them in. They're not charged for transportation. We can't get the money from the people because they don't have it. We can't get it from the pastors of the parishes because they have to go out every summer making appeals to get the money to get their parishes and their mission churches through another year. And we cannot get the help from the Diocese of Lexington because the Diocese of Lexington is known as a mission diocese. If you ever travel around the city of Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm sure some of you have, you can find some very beautiful horse farms. About two-thirds of the diocese is in Appalachia, and there are no farms there of any kind, just hills. And that's why I've come here. I didn't come here just to ask for your help. I came here to beg for it to beg that after Mass you find one of these envelopes that says Pierce Fathers on it, put something in it and drop it in a basket, any basket. It's got our name on it. They'll know where it goes. And if you can't do that today, take the envelope home, put something in it, and drop it in the basket next week. But I want you to be clear about how the money is being used, and I break it down into three ways. First, to give young people. 
whether they be Catholic or non-Catholic, and most of our students are not Catholic. In fact, in the county where I live, there are only six Catholic teenagers. But to give them all a good college preparatory education, with the hope that someday after graduating from college, after gaining some experience, they might return to Eastern Kentucky and open up a business that will employ 10, 12, 15 people. Last year we had our 27th graduation. And I'm proud to say that every single member of those 27 graduating classes has gone on to college. Second way in which we use is to help the people in the area by doing some of the things you might be doing here, distribution of food, clothing. Some of the things you probably don't do here is help out the public schools. Every year we get a phone call from the, some public school saying something like, we've run out of primary paper and our funding has run out. Can you help us? And we'll send over primary paper to what they call the resource center for the resource center to give to the teachers in the public grade school to use in the classroom. But most of all, we spread our Catholic faith by teaching it in the classroom. So when a student goes home and some in the family or a neighbor says something against Catholics, they're able to say, no, Catholics don't believe that. And finally, some of it goes to help people in ways I never would have thought of before going to Eastern Kentucky. I like the woman to telephone one morning and explained that her son had died. And people were coming to her home for the funeral tomorrow. And she wanted to give them all a sandwich when they left. Many funerals are still conducted from the homes and burials take place in family cemeteries on hillsides. But she had the money for bread, but then had the money for lunch meat, mayonnaise, mustard, pickles, soft drinks. Could we help? And we did. We are all part of a mission church. You're here. You can't be in Appalachia. We're there. But we cannot do the work that God has called us to do without the help of people like you here. So please, when Mass is over, find one of those envelopes and put something in it, either today or next week. But on behalf of the people that work with me, the young people in our schools, and the many, many people living in the hollers of Eastern Kentucky that you'll be helping, I want to thank you, and may God bless you. Let's stand for the profession of faith. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate on the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our Lord has told us that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he is present there. So we know he is here with us in a very special way. With that in mind, let's make known to him those things that concern us deeply. For the Church, that we may strive always to be open to the Holy Spirit in living out the Gospel in our daily lives, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For political leaders at every level, that they may be compassionate to those who are most vulnerable, to those who have been overlooked or forgotten, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our Jewish friends and neighbors whose celebration of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, ends Sunday, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those affected by natural disasters, including the fires on the West Coast and those in the path of the hurricanes, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all missionary work, especially the Order of the Purest Fathers, who we are grateful to host this weekend, that they may be abundantly blessed in their ministry. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our St. Agnes Parish community may always welcome others at all times with the generosity modeled by the landowner in today's Gospel, and for those on our sick list and book of prayer. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for Harry and Romaine Thompson, for whom this Mass is being offered, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, hear our prayers. Not just those that were spoken out loud, but also those that remain within the depths of our hearts. Answer them so that the hope and the trust that we have in you right now may continue to grow each day of our lives. <clears throat> we ask this through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive with favor, O Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his Paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deeds by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death, summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins.